Hello and welcome to today's workshop, How to Harness the Power of Google for Your Community Organization. My name is Lynn Gidluck and I have the privilege of leading the Community Engagement and Research Centre at the University of Regina. Now, as we brace for a spring storm that the Weather Channel is saying will be the worst in 50 years, I choose to maintain a positive attitude and think of this as winter's last gasp before we finally see spring in Treaty 4 territory. I'm so glad you could join us today for the final session in our digital yeah. communications and marketing uh, skills workshop series. If you missed the first two sessions in this series, not to worry, videos are posted on our website and I'll put a link in the chat. Um, if you're not already on our email list, but want to make sure you don't miss out on future professional development opportunities, mm -hmm. drop your name and email in the chat for me. You definitely won't want to miss out our next workshop series on nonprofit management essentials. I'll pop a poster in the chat with more information, including the dates, times, and links where you can register. Community Engagement and Research Centre is pleased to offer these workshops in partnership with the South Saskatchewan Community Foundation. And uh, I'm happy that uh, Karen Henders from uh, the Community Foundation is here with us today. So thank you, Karen, for all the great work that uh, you guys do at the South Saskatchewan Community Foundation and for sponsoring this series. While today's workshop is taking place online and we have people from across the province and I think even from around the country joining us, the South Saskatchewan Community Foundation and the Community Engagement and Research Centre have physical homes on the traditional territory of the Nehewa, Anasinipec, Nakoda, Dakota and Lakota First Nations and the homeland of the Métis. With no further ado, I am now pleased to turn the floor over to the Google, Google girl, Barb <laughs> McGrath, who is the founder of uh, Get Found Digital Marketing Program and Saskatchewan's first approved Google agency, Above the Fold Digital Marketing. Barb's <laughs> list of credentials and experience is so vast and so impressive that, you know, I wouldn't even know where to start, but we're just so delighted that uh, she's able to find time to share some of her insights uh, with us today, even though she's not feeling uh, the best. And uh, Barb has indicated to me that she may have to speak a little bit uh, um, softer than she normally does. Um, but uh, we're very grateful, Barb, that even though you weren't feeling as good as you, uh, up to par as you normally would, that you are still able to join us. So over to you now, Barb, and thanks again. Awesome. Thank you, Lynn. Yeah. So I woke up with this funny scratch in my throat and of course I did the, the test and so far it's negative and we'll see what happens in the next couple of days. But the good news is even if it's positive and I'm with all of you this morning, uh, it doesn't matter because you can't catch it through my computer monitor. So we're all safe. That's the important thing. Um, I'm going to be sharing my presentation and Lynn, I don't know how to tell people how to do this. When I go full screen with the presentation, my bubble will change here, like my little box. How do they make that be full screen? <laughs> I never even thought of this when we were talking in the few minutes before. Can I know in Google Meet, I can be pinned so that I become full screen. Vic, do you know? Yeah, I was about to just step in and help. So all people have to do is click on, your, on yours when they hover over it, there'll be three like a blue square in the top right corner with three dots hit that and then they'll just press pin and then it should become the majority of the screen okay perfect so maybe i'll do that with my screen as well um pin there we go awesome okay so i can't see everybody anymore but now at least i'll know what you're seeing okay perfect and i was teasing lynn before we got started this morning um i have my chat over here and then my presentation so I can talk to you guys. So I have the chat open. As we go through the discussion this morning, you guys, if you have any questions, if something doesn't make sense, pop it into the chat and we're going to try and answer questions as we go. So with that, we are ready to rock and roll. Okay, I'm going to actually come back to the screen just to get us started. There we go. So it's working. Okay, so these days it kind of seems like everyone is spending all of their time online and being able to support a community organization, it's like way down the priority list. I spent over a decade in the nonprofit and charity sector, and then I've spent another 20 years as a volunteer. And one thing really sticks for me, 
And that is that there is never enough time, people, or budget. And so when, we, when Lynn invited me to speak with you today, I thought, you know what? Like I did a little bit of reminiscing and I thought, you know, for the Robbies of the world from Special O, when that's, when, that's where I used to be, um, those are the stories that really stuck with me. And so though my career has really changed, I want to take you down that path and talk about how the Robbies from Special O of the world can get more support from Google. Uh, oh, Lynn, you're just sharing me. I gotta, I have to, I'm terrible with the chat. If I see something, I'm like right away, want to answer a question. Okay. Did you know that Google is the busiest street corner in town? Five billion times every day, people go to Google to search for information and to solve a problem. So that's a ton of Google it, right? Hey, Google. In fact, I don't even have my phone in here right now because I'm going to use the word Google so many times in the next 90 minutes that my phone would be chirping the entire time. Google has become that household verb for us. It is the most well-recognized brand on the planet. The funny thing about Google is you don't have to dance in front of a camera, wait for that good hair day, or start like pointing randomly around your screen to get in front of your audience. When they want to solve a problem, they're going to Google. And I always like to say that when they have that credit card in hand, they're ready to attend an event, uh, they want to make a donation, they've seen something that you are doing that they want to contribute to, they're doing it from Google. For those of you who are new to me, uh, Lynn did the introductions, but of course, um, I try and teach local organizations how to turn those social media fans and followers into actual volunteers, into those people that you need, attendees at your events, uh, donors, and board members. I can't even count the number of times that I've seen community organizations looking for board member volunteers and people just aren't putting up their hand right now. A big part of that is getting in front of the right people. And, you know, again, Google's gonna help you do all of that without you having to dance, unless that's your thing. But more importantly, I want you to think about how you can stop chasing that fractured social media audience and start building long-term compound value in your organization. So as we're getting started this morning, I just want to have a little bit of a chat and maybe I'll make the chat just a little bit bigger so I can see. Um, because I'm going to ask you some questions and give you a couple little tidbits right away here as we're get, getting started. If you are a note taker, people always say to me, you know, Barb, help me know, you know, what I really want to write down. So this is your nudge if you are that note taker. Google is the only platform that exists today whose sole purpose is to help you get more done and accomplish more. If you were a for-profit business, they would want you to sell more, get more bookings, that type of thing. As a community organization, they want you to be able to get the support that you need to sustain the organization for the long term. But why don't we talk about social media? And, you know, I kind of have a funny answer for that one, because as we said in the very first um, opening lines or whatever, it feels like everybody is on social media and they're doing dances all over the screen without even knowing you guys. And in fact, I can't see how many people are with us. Um, so there's lots, but without even knowing you, if as a community organization, you are using social media to find your audience and get in front of your audience, then chances are you're doing okay. Maybe you're even doing good or great. But as we go through our conversation this morning, I want to see if I can convince you that not everything happens on social media. What no one is talking about is how to start to turn those fans and followers into your donors, your subscribers, your attendees. No one's talking about how do we attract more support for our community organization. And if you're a charity with us this morning, of course, Google has their $10,000 per month ad credit program. So right off the hop, 
there's $10,000 that you don't have to spend from your budget. And in fact, most charities can't even spend all of it. So most wouldn't even spend $10,000. So that's why I want to focus on Google. That's where my interest in Google comes from, because I see change. I see how we can start to change the paradigm. And hopefully through our conversation today, um, you might start to see that as well. So now I do want you to hop into the chat because I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. And these aren't related to being a community organization. Get your fingers posed on the keyboard because here come my two questions. The last time you were looking for a service, maybe it was a natural path, um, acupuncture, get your nails done, get your hair done, uh, trying to think of something, guys, maybe you're getting the beards trimmed. The last time you were looking for a service, did you go to Google? when you were ready to actually do something about getting that service? Or did you go to social media and start hunting around? Tell me in the chat if you went to Google or social media. While you're responding, I'm gonna ask the same question with a little bit different spin. The last time you had an emergency, you needed a plumber, you needed a dentist, we almost had to call one last night, okay? Did you use Google or social media? Okay, so social media, local business groups. Yep, Vic, that's an answer that I see at least once every time I ask that question. Carrie, Lifelong Learning Center. Carrie, is that at the university? Neither, Donna says neither. So Donna, when you needed to solve that problem, where did you go? Well, for that particular problem, I'm involved in a, a networking referral group called BNI and I went to my BNI members. <laughs> Excellent. Yes, that close network. Yes. Got it. That's a very good one. Okay. Uh, social media, Ellen says, uh, Google to search and then book the appointment. So lots of Google, let's say 90% Google and 10% other. And you know what, that actually lines up pretty closely with what we see in terms of Google search results. Because the majority of customers are not scouring through social media trying to find a plumber when it's an emergency in your toilets backing up at two o'clock on a Saturday night or something like that, right? Um, Facebook groups, absolutely. I do the same thing. I belong to a couple of groups. Uh, they're local business groups. I'll hop in there and I'll probably get three, four or five responses in terms of the problem I'm trying to solve. And then I'll go Google them to learn more, look at their websites. Uh, read their reviews. So then I look for a little bit more information before I actually make contact. If we start to think about social media as an awareness tool, so asking in the group made me aware, seeing a post made me aware, seeing a reel made me aware. So social media has kind of become the TV of the 80s and 90s, or excuse me, the radio of the 2000s. Social media helps us share, connect, and make people aware, but it was never intended to actually help businesses, organizations sell stuff, collect donations. That was never its primary purpose. Okay, and Kim, uh, Google, yes, CCE, Carrie, we met many, many moons ago. I don't know if you even remember. I recognize the name right away. Okay, so Google. How many people here think they know how they rank on Google? How many people think they know how they rank on Google? And let me answer that question too. Oh, Carrie, I just realized that was a direct message. See, I can't, can't compute all of that that quickly. Okay, uh, tell me in the chat. Do you think you know how you rank on Google? And if you don't, uh, let me know because we can help you figure out how you rank on Google. It's actually fairly simple. Okay, so Donna says no, don't know, some no's. So hopefully by the time we're done today, that's kind of the one question that I'd like you guys to be asking yourself. How do I rank on Google and what do I do about it? Okay, so getting lots of no's and don't know's depends on what you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely carry it does. Does it sound familiar to anybody? Uh, I didn't know your organization did that. Or what? That was your guys' event? Really? You have that group service? 
as a community organization, we tend to think that our audience knows what we do. Well, this person's on our email list, so they must know what we do. They follow us on social, so they must know what we do, right? We make that presumption. And the number of times that I suspect you hear that someone didn't know, it's frustrating. It's like, what do you mean you didn't know? You're on our list. We email you every week or every month. How do you not know this stuff? But people are caught up in their own world and their own life. And so we do, we tend to forget who we can go to when we need, need services, support, whatever that might be. Am I still full screen? I am. I am supposed to be not full screen anymore. <laughs> Lynn, my bubbles didn't work. I missed one. <laughs> okay, let's kick off with just a little bit of psychology this morning. So we humans, we tend to be pretty predictable, right? Even in its most basic form, when we make a decision, when we decide we want to take an action, we go through these three steps, awareness, consideration, and conversion. So we become aware of a solution to a problem that we're having. And I'm going to convince you in a couple of minutes here, I hope that, you know, when I think about a problem, it doesn't mean it has to be negative. Okay. Not all problems are negative, but we become aware. Then we consider the options, right? What are the, how can I solve this problem? And then we take an action or a conversion. And let's just look at it as an example, buying a package of gum. Quite often, that's something that we'll buy on impulse. So you're standing in line at 7-Eleven, you've got your coffee in your hands, you're on the way to work and you spot your favorite gum. Maybe it's something that they don't often have, but you spot your favorite gum. All of a sudden, you're aware of a solution to a problem you didn't even necessarily know you had, but it's like, oh, that's my favorite. I never see that. So we kind of, we stand back, right? We look at the counter. We're trying to see if we can um, find something else. Like, is this the one that we want? So we're considering our options. We're looking at the brands and the flavors, right? And then boom, we take an action. We pick up that pack of gum and we hand it to the cashier uh, with our coffee. And so instantly we've bought a pack of gum. That process is sometimes so fast in our minds that we're not even aware that we just made a decision. So it's an impulse purchase. But that same process applies across the spectrum. Even when you're buying a vehicle, you look at all the options, right? You're aware of what's out there. You're looking at the options. You take an action. So at its most basic, that's the process that we go through. Okay, so I want to show you this diagram. And if you look on the far left, you can see that social media paid ads, they become a tool in your toolbox to increase awareness of your organization. So social media paid ads, all about awareness. Your website, your listing, two other pieces of information that you're going to find on that first page of Google, they become helping people find you, doing a little bit of research, and making the decision to take an action. That's what we want to be able to drive more of our supporters to, is taking that action. So there's actually three simple steps to getting to that first page of Google. And that's what I want to show you this morning. The first thing that I want you to think about is being on the first page of Google means feeling like a best friend, someone who's always there for your supporters, for your audience, your front and center, your top of page, you're a click or two away. Those are the equivalent of your Google ads right at the top of the page, right there when customers or supporters, volunteers, donors, right there when they're looking for you. Your website has no surprises. If I sign up to volunteer with your organization, I want to know everything I need to know before I make the commitment. And your website tells me that. If I want to attend an event, I want to find all the details for that event right on your website. The time, the date, the location, 
I want to be able to find all of it. So there are no surprises. And getting to that first page, that is what makes it easy for your supporters to find you. Your Google listing is one of the easiest actions that can be taken. Uh, How did I get muted? And how long have I been muted? Since the slide before. Oh, that's bizarre. I don't know okay. what happened there, Barb. Yeah, I don't either. Okay. Um, so I'm going to assume that everyone can hear me again. Joanne, thank you for posting that. I have no idea. I didn't touch anything. My hands are talking, but anyway. All right, uh, back to my question. Uh, has anyone here ever been on a diet? Tell me in the chat, have you been on a diet, any sort of diet? And if I have the first audience in history to, okay, good. <laughs> okay, there we go. Lots of folks are willing to be vulnerable this morning. Brene would be happy. <laughs> so for those of you who have been on a diet, I, uh, you know, you pr probably learned fairly quickly that you can't eat more potato chips and expect to lose weight, right? Potato chips was not the solution to your woes. And you probably even learned that less potato chips really wasn't going to get you there either. To be successful on a diet, you had to change something, move more, eat better, be healthier, whatever that holy grail was for you you had to change something. And attracting more supporters is exactly the same as successfully dieting. You have to do something different. More social media? Nope, social media is like potato chips. We don't want more of it. A little less social media might move the needle, but to really start to shake things up around here, thank you, Meatloaf, you need to be where your supporters are when they're solving the problem. And that's that first page of Google. So you guys have probably all heard the joke, where do you hide a dead body? If you haven't heard it before, well, now you have. And you hide it on the second page of Google. Because when your supporters are looking to solve that problem and they go to the first page of Google, we need to understand what they're searching for and how we can start to help them solve that problem. Because I've talked problems a few times throughout the presentation here already this morning, I want to start to define what that looks like. If we can agree that our supporters typically have something they want to solve, then we need to think about how we can be the solution. Okay, so every one of your supporters had some type of problem they were looking to solve. If, for example, you're a dog rescue, well, then your supporters are looking to add a furry person, animal, they're not people, are they? Animal to their home, right? If you are a nonprofit counseling service, then people are looking for support. But whatever it is, they were looking to solve a problem. And I just want to say here that um, there's very little that we do as humans that doesn't solve a problem. Even something like going for a relaxing massage solves a problem for me because I'm craving relaxation. Yes, it feels good. Yes, it's a reward, but it solves a problem. And so when I'm looking at that community organization, when I look at that sector, there are tens of thousands of people who are driven to be involved in the community. They need to give back. They have an inherent need. So their problem is during COVID or any type of insul insulation, isolation, they need to be able to be involved. I'm guessing that many of you found a way through COVID for your volunteers to continue to stay active because people needed to give back. 
The other thing that we see, the second thing that all of your supporters have in common is 90% of them. Remember I said that's about average, 10% went to social to Google a problem. 90% of people will Google a problem before they try and solve it. They're either looking for a business that can solve it. They're looking for a community organization that can solve it. They're looking to be philanthropic, right? And so 90% are Googling that problem. I want to differentiate because one of the things that folks often hear when I make that statement is, oh, people are doing everything online. No, that's not what I'm saying. 90% of people made the decision, uh, whoops, and that one still says buy. 90% of people made the decision to take an action based on the information that they found online. So when you step back and you look at your website, maybe you're running some Google ads, you look at your Google listing, is the information that you're providing to that 90% of your audience, is that the information that you want to be providing? We talk lots on social media, so I'm not going to spend any time here, but I do want to talk about chasing that fractured audience. When Lynn asked me to do the presentation today, I kind of thought, yeah, here's some things I want to share with them. There's also some things I want you to start to think about how do we unlearn these habits, right? Again, think back to dieting. In order to be successful, I also had to stop doing some things. I may have started, but I needed to stop. And so what if we posted to social, me social media just a little bit less, and instead we paid that attention to Google? What if we stopped chasing our audience from channel to channel and trend to trend, and instead we looked at, hmm, how can I be in front of them when they actually go to solve the problem. The difference between those two things is push and pull. Social media pushes information at whoever is at the end of the device. When your supporters want information, they're pulling it. They're pulling it from your website. They're pulling it from your listing. They're pulling it if you have a Google ad. So they're pulling that information and when we pull information, the likelihood of taking an action is that much higher, okay? So if we start to think about how do we put these two things together, Google and social media, it's like social media is just plain fries, Google adds the ketchup. The movie, you gotta have popcorn, right? A campfire, you gotta have marshmallows. And no, I haven't had breakfast yet today. <laughs> so I don't know where those came from. But the two go hand in hand, right? And so Google on its own, it can be with your supporter throughout their entire journey. If you decided as an organization to do no social media at all, you could move the customer from awareness, consideration, and action. You could move uh, your supporters through that whole thing. And that's because when we think about Google, they're a matchmaking service. And I want you guys to start to think about what solution do we offer to our supporters? Because when Google is a matchmaking service, they know the search terms that your audience is using. Your audience, they go searching to solve a problem. You have that solution. You have that professional development opportunity as a volunteer. You have that philanthropic opportunity as a donor. <clears throat> you have um, events that can be attended that support the community. So you have all of those solutions. And those two things together create that match. And that's how Google becomes a matchmaking service. Not a single one of your supporters is buying or donating or signing up simply because they want to, they're doing it because they have that inherent need to do more, to give back. And, and that's the problem that they're trying to solve. Can anyone tell me in the chat, I know that this is maybe changing the paradigm a little bit, but what problem do you solve? And if, it, if it's still easier to think of it in sort of 
um, in terms of the reward that you provide, then tell me that. But what do you solve for your audience? And right now, I'm, I'm not really focused on clients because I know many of you have a client arm as well. But if it's easier to think that way, then definitely give me that example. Can you reframe what you do in your organization as a solution? Okay. Child poverty. Yep. Building our next generation of leaders today. Absolutely, Donna. Mm -hmm. City kids, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Alleviate poverty again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Conservation and nature preservation. Yeah, Ellen, that's a, that's a really good one. Absolutely. You know, and it's, it's funny. Uh, I just had a lengthy conversation about um, being environmentally friendly on the weekend with my social circle. Uh, and, you know, at the end of it, I said, oh, being environmentally friendly is a lot of work, but it's just what I need to do. It's, it's how I am inherently wired. So, yep. Well, for advocacy, um, build a community for newcomers. A absolutely, Victoria. Well-trained dog. Okay, awesome, Joanne. Okay, so when we start to think about that problem we solve, it's highly unlikely that a customer goes, sorry guys, I keep throwing customer in there, supporter. <laughs> um, it's highly unlikely that a supporter goes to that first page of Google and says, who can I give my money to, right? They start with what's important to them, whether that's children, poverty, homelessness, um, food supply, whatever that might be, all right? So when we start to think about pain or pleasure, you as an organization will always solicit more volunteers, more donors, more support when you present it as a problem being solved. We are hardwired to solve problems versus just looking for a reward. If you can solve my problem, I will spend more money with your organization. I will donate more. I will give you more time. Okay. But just because I'm talking about problems, you guys, I don't want you to get stuck in, oh, this is negative. And I'm going to use a for-profit business example here, but an organic grocery store, uh, in fact, we used to have a co-op grocery store, and I don't mean the co-op, but organic grocery store, they don't promote, uh, don't kill your family, shop organic. They take a positive spin to their message, right? And so eat better, eat local, shop local, eat organic. So when I talk about problems, I don't mean be negative. I simply mean focus on what that problem is that your audience wants to be able to alleviate. Okay, something really weird is going on with slides here too. My slides are skipping. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm in the right place. All right, how Google works. So to understand how, how to get to that first page of Google, we need to understand just a couple of things about how it actually works. And Google is just a big old calculator. In the instant after a supported search, supporter searches for something, Google is calculating the best solution that they can put in front of you because they want you to get more done, attract more people, find more resources. They want to send traffic to a local business whenever they can, a local organization. If you think just for a second uh, about Amazon, I know that that's not something that you guys would ever really worry about competing about. But think about Amazon. When I Google almost anything, Amazon shows up right at the top. Their ad shows up, maybe their website even shows up. And it's because they're tending to what they need to do on that first page of Google. And that's why I want you to start to rethink, change that paradigm uh, in terms of how you're approaching the work that you do to sustain your organization over the long term. Okay, we already talked about the three ways. So let's let's start to dig in. So if you are a note taker, these next uh, number of slides are gonna be really important because we're gonna start to dig into each of the three ways and the how to's. So we have Google Ads, we've talked about that already. Google Ads is absolutely uh, the first and the fastest, okay? Your website, 
that's also on the first page of Google. 10 websites will make it to the first page of Google. If you have competitors in the private sector, uh, then they will also be looking for one of those first 10 spots. Google reports on the first 10 spots on 10 pages. So they report on 100 placements in terms of where your community organization might fit. The last one, and um, some of you might know this as Google My Business, but it's now called Google Business Profile. And it tends to be the most forgotten business tool that's out there. It's free, it's 100% free, and so many organizations are forgetting about it. All of these, your website, your ad, these are all strategic business tools. And so when we think about, here's what we do on social to help people remain aware, here's what we do to get our supporters to take an action. And this listing is one of the most forgotten tools that are out there, okay? What I often see happen is you, you get busy. Social is an, sometimes an all day, every day thing where Google is a few hours a month. Google doesn't take the time and effort at all that social media does. So we tend to forget about it. So your website, it starts to go static after a while. Maybe even it's a, a little bit out of date. Your listing, well, you might not even be sure if you can find the password for that one because we've helped many a person uh, recover that password. And if resources are already tight, if budget's tight, well, chances are you're not running a Google ad. But what we do do is we say, oh, but that post on, on Facebook yesterday, we got like 800 views on, on that video. Like it was awesome. And we got 27 likes. But where do those 827 people go when they're taking the action? That's why it's so important to think about each of these pieces. So when we look at Google ads, um, whether it's a social media ad, a Google ad, traditional radio, whatever it might be, they are all pay to play. You pay the money and whomever you are paying will give you the benefit in the, in the near term, in the short term, right? If you decided after you're done today that you wanted to create a Google ad, you could do it in 15 minutes, okay? So it doesn't have to be an exhaustive process. Um, when we look at ads, they are absolutely everywhere. They are on the first page of Google. They are on the 10th page of Google. They're all over our social media feed. Um, Google follows you around if you've got display ads and you've been looking at something. Uh, I found out a Christmas present one year because the um, uh, Hilberg and Burke spark sparkle ball started following me all over the internet, right? Which is good because I was like, hey, happy dear. Uh, not looking for this for Christmas, just in case you're thinking about it. To this day, he swears he wasn't, but I swear he was. So ads are absolutely everywhere. Uh, tell me in the chat, I'm going to start to talk about what you want to put into an ad if you are thinking about Google ads, but I'd love to have a sense of how many people are either using one or have used one. So tell me in the chat there. Okay, so I'm going to give you four times when I would like you to think about a Google ad. Now, if resources are still tight, then there's only a couple of these that will apply. But when you're trying to reach a whole new audience, right, you want to get in front of a completely new audience. And if we use the example of masks, up until two years ago, none of us would have considered going out buying masks and, or buying medical masks, right? Doctors and dentists, that was it. All of a sudden, Every manufacturer of masks were running ads everywhere because the competition for ads was huge and supply was ridiculously low because of how quickly we needed them. So manufacturers were trying to get in front of an entirely new audience. For you, it might look like something where you want new attendees in a, pay, a paid group or support program. Maybe you've got a funded program through the organization and you're providing support. So you wanna get bums in those seats, okay? Uh, or attendees at an event. You're hosting a community event, you're hosting a fundraiser. Google ads can be a fantastic way to be right there front and center, okay? You're probably doing the work on social as well, 
I am not suggesting at all that you want to do one and not the other. Okay. Any questions on that one before I move on? I noticed somebody's mic just popped open. No. Okay. So the second time that I would like you to think about a Google ad is when something is really competitive. And as a community organization, lots of you are probably thinking, well, that doesn't apply to us. Well, it does because we have a number of nonprofit medical services, counseling services, mental health services, and fitness services. And each of those are highly competitive. Trying to access counseling services, mental health services can be really, really difficult. We had one participant uh, in our Get Found program who uh, they were in the mental health space and they are a charity. So they got funding from Google uh, to start to do some ads and they filled their programs. Their group programs were filled, uh, their horse programs were full, they filled up. And so getting the message in front of people when they're actually looking to pull the information can make a huge difference. So I'm seeing a couple people. Uh, Kelly says how to donate. Kate, uh, Ellen hasn't. Uh, Donna has not. And Danielle has not. Kate, but Kelly has. Awesome, you guys. Okay. Uh, low loyalty and high entry. You know, I could dig around to find a community example here, but you guys, here's my best example. When we go on our winter vacations, which we as Canadians so desperately want and likely miss for the last two years, we have very low loyalty to the country or resort that we go to, maybe even the uh, carrier that we fly with, but it's a very high cost entry. So when something has low loyalty, when we as customers are, are not very loyal to something, but it's an expensive thing, that's where you will see many Google ads. And if we look to the for-profit sector, all you have to do is look at vehicle sales when there is actually vehicles on the lot. And because of the competition, there are constantly ads at the top. Right now, there's no supplies. Well, there's very few. The fourth time that I would like you to think about it, and uh, I'm going to give you a caveat for this one. I want you to have a for-profit or revenue generating arm before you just jump into a Google ad simply for the sake of being on the first page. When we think about the cost behind a Google ad, it can be as little as a few cents. I have a Google ad running right now and my cost per impression is six cents. So it seems really inexpensive, but then there's a cost to actually get somebody to the website that we're advertising and get them to take an action. So six cents sounds great, but you still have to add it all up. So if you're not on that first page of Google and you either A, have that charity credit from Google, B, have a revenue generated, revenue generating arm or a funded program that you can fill, then the Google ad would be something that I would suggest that you want to look at. Okay. If you don't have those pieces, you don't have an event, you don't have that piece, then it's quite likely that the Google ad will cost you money and you'll have a much harder time <clears throat> tying it back to something that is going to bring um, funding into the organization. Okay. In terms of a budget, uh, I think most people are here in Saskatchewan with us. So if you're in Regina or Saskatoon, somewhere in that 300, 350, 400 mark is gonna, will work for you. Uh, if you're in a Kelowna or a Kitchener Waterloo, uh, if you're down from Ontario, then you're probably looking more at that $500 um, or up budget. So just to kind of give you a sense for where you would start. If you are a provincial organization, then you're probably looking at something like 750 a month in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. And if you were go to go to Alberta, you're probably you know, pushing it towards that thousand dollar mark. Okay, so that just kind of gives you a sense of where, where you would start with. Uh, again, so if you're a nonprofit and you have a revenue generating arm, it can make sense. You wanna start cautiously, but it, it would make sense. If you're a charity and you're approved for the ad credit, well, then it's kind of no holds barred. 
One thing I do want to say is Google doesn't give you a limit for your Google ad. You can start literally with like $1 a month. There is no minimum. And the benefit to doing that, not that you would start the ad for a dollar, but by having the Google ad account, the information that you have access to is ginormous. I'm sure that word is in the dictionary somewhere. It is huge. The amount of information that you can access on who your audience is, who those supporters are, is absolutely huge. Um, but what are you going to put in an ad? Okay, great. We decided we're going to spend $300 uh, on a Google ad and we have an event coming up at the end of the month. We want to make sure that we have uh, all of the seats in the event full. What the heck do I put in an ad, Barb? There's two things that a Google ad can be. Thank you. Uh, I need to come down here. There we go. Thank you very much. Uh, two things that I want you to think about. A solution those solutions that you guys listed off for me in the chat. I want you to think about how you could use that solution. So finding support when you need it most, after the loss of a loved one, after a tragedy, okay? But finding that support when you need it most. Or fitness, get fit and New Year's resolutions. Because we have a few different nonprofits and charities who all also offer a fitness solution. Absolutely. Get out in front of that. Absolutely. Or uh, if I look at all of the sports through the, through South sport, right? Try a new sport. Your kids will love it. So you can put all of those message from messages from a solutions standpoint, right in front of the customers. The other option, the other option, and this is just slightly uh, different for a community organization. But if I think about stage of life, when, when we get a little bit older, we start to think about our will and philanthropy and planning. So, you know, there are some really strong messages to start to think about, hmm, are you planning, uh, you know, to leave funds for an organization, a cause, right? That's where Karen and Victor's organization really comes into play. And so those would be some of the messages that they would focus on. Google ads do particularly well when the supporter, when they're ready to take an action, when they're actually ready to do something. When they're still in the research phase, this is when they'll go to your website. Okay. 96% of people, when they hit that first page of Google, will click on something. They might click on an ad, they might click on a website, and they might click on a listing, but they click on something. Remember I told you at the very beginning that 5 billion times every day people are searching for something on Google? 96% times 5 billion, I don't know what that actually equals, and I didn't figure it out in advance, but that's huge. It's absolutely huge, right? It's mind-boggling. So your website position, what page you're on, and the position on that page are all earned simply by following Google's rules and using something called search engine optimization. That's what we're going to talk about in these next few slides is what is SEO or search engine optimization, okay? Remember from the very beginning, I told you the website is about no surprises. More supporters will support you more when there's no surprises. See, my slide just skipped again. What the heck here? Okay, uh, what I do want you to think about is how do your supporters actually search for you? Because we tend to think that they go, hmm, I need to get counseling. But they don't. They search for things like, why am I worrying so much? Why am I having problems sleeping? Can I find a counselor near me? Do I need counseling? Oh, I'm going to have to find a cheap counselor because counseling is really expensive, right? These are the things that people look for. And it's across the board. Pick an industry, your supporters, your customers, everything. We are Googling cheap, which is really worrisome because like things like cheap dentist and cheap car, yeah, I don't know. There's some things, some things are worth, worth the money. We also don't just search for get in shape or how do I get in shape? 
we'll search for a gym near me, the best gym in Saskatoon, right? Or a gym open late if you're maybe a nurse, right? And you need that flexibility. So as we get into tools, I think I may have just segued this slide. I'm going to go back here in a second. There's four tools that are listed on this slide. Again, if you're taking notes, write these four things down because in each of these tools, they're all free. They're all Google tools. And if you can get into your Google listing, you can get in here. Okay. Uh, these four tools will give you, you have access to the exact keywords that your supporters are looking for. I need to do a better job on my business profile. I need to figure out my website. You go in here and you can find all of those keywords. But to go back now <laughs> to ranking your website, uh, one of the first things that we almost always see 80% of the time, you guys, I tell people name, address, phone number, hours, they need to be consistent across the web. Um, Vic probably still has nightmares about me saying that so many times when he was in our program. And it is so important, but 80% of the time, it's not accurate. When you actually start to look, it is not accurate. So what's the impact? Let's just say that there's a discrepancy and let's just assume it's a little discrepancy. The way Google works as that calculator, Google is constantly scanning the information about your organization that's out there. And when they find a discrepancy, it's kind of like they put a question mark in a box because it's they're not going to not send traffic to you, but when they notice an inaccuracy, they kind of go, oh, well, wait a second. We want our traffic going to places where there's accurate information. So they just put a question mark. And if those question marks start to pile up, then it absolutely will start to, to impact your rank. Okay. So name, address, phone number, hours. I know it sounds super simple. Uh, if you do, if, if you do send me an email and you'd like to know how you rank, you'll see in what I send you back that you can find all of these discrepancies. There's, I think there's 14 different places that we scan. So it's just kind of cool. Uh, and even my own, I'm like, how did that change? I did not change it, but, but these, these, um, listing places, they go and they find information to keep your information up to date. And sometimes they change it and it's wrong. And it's a pain in the arse, folks, but it's the reality of our online world. So there you go. There's my spoiler alert. Okay, we talked about this one. So using those four tools um, and then being search engine friendly, right? Finding those keywords in the tools and using those keywords on your website. So I'm going to show you kind of what that looks like in reality. So if I was to Google my own business, get found digital marketing, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and this isn't current. If you look today, it's not quite this text, but it doesn't matter. Okay, so this is what it looks like when it pulls up on a web page. Because I knew the keywords that my customers were looking for, I knew that I needed to work in get found on Google, learn digital marketing, certificate and certification, local, um, RSTS or 100% funding that we have in place right now right? And the job grant. So I needed to be able to work all of that in there. When you go to your business profile, when you go to your search console, you're going to find a very similar type of list. And I don't care if you put them on a sticky beside your desk, you want to work those words into your title, into your description of the page. If you're on WordPress, you're going to use something called Yoast. If you're on Wix, then you're going to use their SEO tool. Every type of website has a way for you to be able to populate this information. Guys, when somebody goes looking, and I don't care if it's donate money, solve a problem, whatever it is, nobody Googles home South Saskatchewan Community Foundation. And sorry, Victor and Karen, if you're there, I don't mean to pick on you. You're in my top corner. No one Googles to find your homepage. Okay, I shouldn't say no one because somebody's going to go look and then call my bluff. Very, very few people are searching for that. They are searching to solve problems in their world. Okay, so that's why those words become so important. The last piece when it comes to your website is creating that content 
for Google first. A couple of minutes ago, I talked about, you know, people are posting to social and they've got one or two posts going out a day and all their new staff are introduced on their social media channels and they look so nice. It's wonderful. Then you go to their website and the CEO from two times ago is still on the website, or maybe it's just one time ago, but he retired six months ago or she retired six months ago. Well, and their marketing manager, when I emailed, uh, it just bounced back. And I'm actually using an example. I will not name the organization, but I have a uh, local organization that I work with every year, <coughs> do a little bit of work with. So I emailed them my annual email to say, hey, are we ready? Not a word back, you guys. Not a word. And it's because, I believe, staff have changed. And so my email is going into the abyss. And not that I don't want to continue to support them, but every year, it's the exact same thing, right? And so your supporters will be feeling the exact same way. Could I go look on their social channel and find more up-to-date information? I might be able to, but I just haven't taken the time because I'm looking to make it as easy for myself as possible because this is my giving back, right? So when I start to think about Google first content, what if you introduce new team members on your website first and then shared it to social media later? What if you posted all of the information for an event on your website first and then shared it to social media? <clears throat> so if we start to think about social media, it's kind of like that sugar high, right? You've just had something really sweet. Oh, it feels good, but it's instant and it's fleeting and it's gone again, right? Where that Google algorithm, it's like your grandma's oatmeal. It sticks to you. It stays with your supporter throughout their entire journey, right? And so social media platforms, they already forgot whatever you posted when you were getting ready for the presentation this morning, where Google continues to keep that content at the top. You are absolutely competing against every other community organization and business that also wants that spot. But when you know, <coughs> when you know the keywords that your customers are using, that's when you will really start to see a difference. Okay, I'm going to switch up to a little bit hotter water again here so we can extend the voice. Okay. <coughs> okay, so let's look at that example. If our Facebook page had a thousand followers and we had a thousand visitors uh, in a month to our website, the current average for a Facebook page is 3% of your people will see a post. On your website, if you're posting something, let's just assume front and center homepage, all 1000 people will see that the first time. They might not consume it, they might not absorb it, but they will see it. On your Facebook page, you have to post 34 times to get those same thousand people to see a single piece of content, to even see you once because there's always the follower who isn't there very often. And if you haven't posted when they're there, <coughs> your content sank down below. I'm just gonna put a cough candy in you guys. If by chance uh, it's causing too much noise on the mic, just let me know. Okay. 34 times, that's a lot of posting. That's posting every single day in a month, plus a couple of extras just for good measure. And that's what I say when I mean, Google doesn't want you posting every day, um, doing dancing videos. Google's not looking for that. That's not going to help you when your supporter wants to take an action. One of the final steps before somebody picks up the phone, goes to a website, goes to a location, is your Google listing. So whether you call it Google My Business, whether you call it Google Business Profile, it's one of the last places that people actually go. <coughs> and the top three searches are best, 
near me and in city. So for you, it might look something like best counselor, best clothing recycle program, um, best pickup program for recycling. It might also be near me, fitness center near me, group support near me. If somebody is Googling near me, 90% of the time, they take an action within 24 hours. So if I want to drop off clothes for donating, within 24 hours, it typically happens. If anyone who is with us today is in an organization that accepts clothing donations, and it's possible that we just don't really have that service anymore, that is one of the hardest services to source out. When you want to drop off clothes for donation, um, there's, I've yet to find a good listing in the city of where all those bins are. So I have no idea how to do that. The third one is in my city. And so again, counselor, Moose Jaw, immigrant services, Saskatoon, immigrant services, women, Regina, museums, Ottawa, right? And so when we start to think about in my city, people want to find the local stuff. And that's what I mean, you guys, when I say Google wants you to find local businesses. That's where your listing comes in because that is what is front and center. I talked earlier about um, lots of organizations are using the ads. Of course, lots of charities are with Google's ad grant. Um, many businesses, many organizations have a website. The number of folks who are actively managing their Google listing is very, very limited. If you take nothing away from today, except she said we should log into our listing and do more stuff, take that away. It will help. This is the listing that I'm referring to. So if you're wondering, what is she actually talking about? It's that snack pack or those three organizations that would be listed. Okay. So that is a Google listing. I already told you that it is 100% free. And so even in a community organization where uh, financial resources are tight, you can do your Google listing. Time, I appreciate, I can't, I can't make more time, but if you spend less time on social media and a little bit more time on Google, then you can make time, right? Inside your Google listing, there are 50 or more data points. It's like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with Google where you get to say, hey Google, here's what our organization does Here's our mission. Here's the people that we help. Here's how people can get a hold of us. And then on a weekly basis, you can start to tell them more about what you do. So Google has this thing called posting. It's just like you would post to social media, except Google wants you to post so that more supporters take an action. That is the whole purpose of having posts inside your Google listing. Reviews are also housed inside your Google listing. So if you have Google reviews, they're also housed in here. When we think about reviews, they are one of the fastest ways that you can move your organization up in those search results. So it will help move your website up. It will also help move your listing up. It is one of the um, fastest. If we think about it from a revenue standpoint for you, we would usually expect that if you went from a three and a half star to a four and a half star, that you would see a bump in terms of donations and support of about five to 9%. So it's actually quantifiable, the improvement that you would see. So again, when you think about any activities that you have that bring in revenue to the organization, your Google listing can be a fantastic place to talk about it. Okay. When a customer leaves a review, people trust that review more than what you say about your organization. And it's because we trust user-generated content, it's called UGC. We trust it more than we trust the organization when it's talking about itself. That really applies in a for-profit environment, but it applies equally to you. If you want me to volunteer, support your organization, 
I need to know that the information I'm finding out there is accurate and others who have also supported you say that it is a good organization to support. Because of the number of scams that are out there online right now, especially you think these last two years through COVID, people being able to find good information about your organization is huge. If you have a review, doesn't matter if it's a Facebook review, a Google review, whatever, house review, whatever you might have. One, I want you to make sure that you respond, click reply to that customer within 24 hours. When they leave a review on Google, that's the equivalent of a customer, never mind just a supporter. So I want you to respond within 24 hours. Having a bad review, which is three stars or less, is not a bad thing. It happens to everyone. It is not a bad thing. You just need to respond to it within 24 hours. Responding, that's how you turn it in, turn it into a positive, have a positive spin on it. A four or five star review, absolutely. Same thing. You still need to respond within 24 hours, but those are positive. So those are a little bit easier. So as we went through our discussion today, uh, we talked about becoming that best friend in front of your supporters. Typically, we think of that like a Google ad because it's top of page, one click away. If I wanted to make a purchase on Amazon, I counted the other day uh, without actually clicking buy, I had to click four times. I could make a purchase in four clicks. It's the kind of convenience that's hard to beat. And even as a um, as a nonprofit or as a charity, you can be there at the right time to get those clicks, but you need to make it easy, right? Your website, see, skipped again. Your website, no surprises. I don't want to buy a ticket to an event just to find out, oh, this is an online event. I didn't realize that. Oh, it's a meal event, but because I'm gluten-free, I have to show up with my own food. I don't want any surprises. So your website needs to tell me absolutely everything. And we want to make it easy. That's where your listing comes in. That makes it so fast and easy for someone to be able to get a hold of your organization. It makes it a painless, friction-free process for your supporter. Here's what I see so often, you guys. Uh, I click the listing and I select the phone. Oh, it's out of date. Okay, let's take a look at their website. Oh, their website's down for maintenance, right? We forget about the actions that our supporters take when they want to talk to us. And we want them talking to us. We want them talking more often, right? So if we go back to your diet, if we want more supporters, or donors, volunteers, clients for your programs, whatever it is, you need to get to that first page of Google. You need to do something different. And I want to challenge you to just start to think about it different. If you add up all the time that you or somebody else in your organization spends on social media, and I'm talking the writing, the planning, the filming, the snapping, the tweeting, the editing, right? Absolutely. That keeps your mission front and, front and center. People are aware. Add all of that up. Is it four hours a week? Tell me in the chat. Just do some really quick math in your head. Is it eight hours a week? Maybe you have a full-time person who just looks after social media. How much time is going into social? Because I'm going to be totally honest with you guys. I spend four hours a month to look after my Google. That's it. And the reason I can do that is because I do a little bit of social and then I do my Google and I keep it up. So if you're thinking or feeling like, gee, I don't have time, you know, am I going to benefit or I'm not sure? I just want you to think about doing something different. And the things you're going to do different, if my slides would keep up, are your listing you're going to have that one-on-one -on -one with Google, all those 50 data points. I want you to start to think about how you can ask supporters for reviews. 
<laughs> Lynn, now I don't feel good. No, now I feel good myself that I don't spend so much time on social media. <laughs> exactly. Exactly, Lynn. Hey, getting more reviews from your supporters. People show up at an event. Awesome. Ask them to leave their feedback on your Google listing, right? Your website, that matchmaking service so that when your supporters are looking, they find your website. Try Googling yourself, not in your office, not from your work computer. Try Googling yourself. Do you see yourself like you think you're going to? Your name, address, and phone number, and hours. Please, please bring that information up to date. There is nothing worse from a customer, supporter, volunteer, donor. There's nothing worse than you're trying to get a hold of the organization and you can't. Okay. And if you're going to look at Google ads, just remember that they are pay to play. So when you're running the ad, if the ticket you're selling is a $25 ticket, but it's costing you $20 to get that 25, then maybe that's not the best fit for your budget. Okay. So there's three numbers that I want you to take away from today. And the first is there's only three ways to be on the first page of Google. Imagine if Social media only had three options, not 14 different channels and videos and posts and reels and right. Imagine if there was only three options and maybe that's why I prefer Google over social media. There's three options. I can pick from, from three easily. 96% of your supporters, they're selecting content from that first page. And Google's only taking me four hours. That's how I have time to have these conversations with you guys. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to head into questions. If anybody is curious to find out how they rank, uh, here, I'll just type my email into the chat. And you guys can just email me. There we go. And Lynn, maybe you want to share that with, with everyone. Whoops, I just did that to one person only. Let's try that again. Okay. Uh, There, now it went to everyone. Okay, uh, and with that, I will return to the screen full time. Anybody who would like to know how they rank, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, questions, you guys. I'm never sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing at the end. <laughs> Silence. You're welcome, Ellen. Thank you for coming. So if there's no additional questions, where do you start? Karen, that's a, a really good question. Your Google listing, go to your listing, get logged in, bring it back up to date and use that same login information to access your Google Analytics, your Google Search Console, um, all of the pieces. So start with your Google listing. Julie, did you have a question? Looks like we have a couple questions in the chat here. Okay, yeah. Uh, would you use Facebook or website for group like seniors at the university? Um, so they would do two really different things. The website could help you build out the information about the group where you may end up using Facebook to engage with people on a day-to-day a -day basis. Um, I would absolutely post about the fact that the group exists to social, but I would have your core foundational information on your website first and then share it into social media, any of the different channels that you're using, Carrie. Okay, and Jane, uh, how do you find your Google listing? Go to business.google.com. That's the login for Google, and I'll type that in here. Okay. The other way to find your business is 
um, just Google yourself and you will likely show up on the right hand panel of the screen. Okay, what about an organization that needs anonymous for their address? Would they just use city example, a women's shelter? Okay, so Valerie, that's a fantastic question. Uh, Google actually has a number of features specific to um, uh, any type of protective services. And so you can hide your address. Um, when you're in your Google listing, if you just serve Regina, or maybe it's, you know, Regina plus 50 kilometers or something like that. When you're in your Google listing, first you would tell Google what your service area is. And then in the actual address area, you would, there's another little button that you click. I know there's so many buttons. Uh, you just hide your address. And so you would never actually show up on the map. You would just have a radius around the community of Regina or whichever community you're in, Valerie. Yep, fantastic question. The Google listing is pretty smart that way. Once you pick and choose the categories and types of organizations that you fit into, um, Google then like gives you extra features. And just for example, um, on ours, because I've selected consultant as one of our categories, I can then create a booking button right on my Google listing. If I take that off, then the button disappears. And so there's a few nuances depending on the category and the industry that you're in, for sure. Yeah. As Barb, nonprofit, go ahead. Oh, uh, you mentioned earlier, Barb, about the um, the data you can get just by having um, a $1 ad or something on, on Google. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yep, for sure. Okay, so once you've created a Google Ads account and if you're a nonprofit, uh, you have to put a you have to put a credit card in there. You don't have to run an ad. You don't have to spend money, but you have to put a credit card in there. If you're a charity and you've already been approved for the charity program, then you're they're going to create the account for you. That's why I differentiate between the two. Um, so with those two different types inside your Google ad account, so it's now created and it's active. They have something called Keyword Planner. And so the keyword planner helps you find keywords on a, a regional basis, on a global basis, whatever basis you want. So if you serve the whole province, you can do some research on keywords in the whole province. Um, same thing, national or even just a single city. So you can really start to dig into that. Um, in there, you can also kind of forecast what kind of traffic you might expect if you ran an ad for a particular event or service. So you can plan all of that out just to minimize the surprises because lots of times a business will start an ad and think, oh, you know, I'm going to blow the doors off. Well, no, because there's billions of businesses out there running the ad. So you really want to be focused. Um, so you can learn, you can learn quite a bit about what that forecast looks like. When you want to get into demographics, male, female, age, uh, even household income, I would go to Google Analytics for that information because it's tracked better. It is for now. Google is um, Google has a new pixel that they want us to move towards using or a new tag, it's called. And the old tag is going to be retired. But for right now, you can get into your Google Analytics account, assuming it's been set up on your website, find age, gender, household income, and interest. Interest can be really, really big. And just for example, even though we're a marketing company uh, and a teaching company, our primary interest continues to be employment because people are constantly looking uh, to change jobs. And so even as a small business, people are, are often asking you know, those questions. So that's just a few of the things that are back there. Um, I was going to say one other thing on the listing. Okay, it's gone. If it comes back, I will share it. Uh, Danielle, the charity ad credit. So if you Google, um, well, first of all, you can Google our website and be in our program. But <laughs> uh, if you look for uh, Google ad credit, Google for charities, if you Google that, 
you literally just follow the process through and, and there's, there's a few hoops. Um, there's definitely a few hoops along the way. Uh, but if you are a registered Canadian charity, you typically are eligible for Google's ad credit. Um, they do check things like your website and like they do some investigation before they'll approve you. And then once you're approved, you just need to know how to continue to manage the ad and um, and the services that you want to be able to promote. So it's it's a fantastic program, absolutely fantastic. And that's actually where I spend my time uh, volunteering is I have a couple of charities at a national level that I do all of their Google ads for. So, yes. Okay, so Joanne, so it, is it only for charities or not? So there is a, quite a bit of confusion there. If you read the fine print, the ad credit is only for registered Canadian charities. There are a couple of competitors in my space who talk about it being for nonprofits. The ad credit itself is only charities. The rest of the Google, sorry, it's called Google for nonprofits, not Google for charity. Uh, the rest of the Google for nonprofits program is eligible for nonprofits. So for example, there's enhanced maps, there's some training courses, um, uh, the Google workspace, Google email, all of those things. Yeah. <laughs> Can you adopt my organization? <laughs> oh, good one, Kelly. It's funny because the organization that I volunteer for is, it's a dog adoption. <laughs> oh, that's too funny. <laughs> and it's, more ironic so like the dogs so we have two dogs they are always down here with me uh and so I'm in the office locked in here today and they're quite perturbed that they can't get to me because this is their routine so I can hear them moving around out there and they're quite perturbed that they can't get to mom uh. Any other questions, you guys? Like, I'm here, throw them at me. <laughs> Darn, Kelly. <laughs> okay, so now that Halls is like stuck to my cheek and I can't get it off. <laughs> oh my goodness. But my voice lasted, yay. <laughs> or I'm gonna... Um, um, ask you to give a plug for your um, training sessions uh, and how people can do them for free because of the government credit. Uh, so if people are uh, thinking, oh, this is, they're maybe a little overwhelmed, but would like to learn more, um, how they can go about doing that. Sure. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So yeah, um, we have Get Found for Charities, uh, which is for charities and nonprofits. And then we have Get Found for Local. The charities and nonprofit program, we do start you at applying for funding if you would be eligible. And we stay with you right from applying for funding uh, until you're approved and we have that first ad up. If you are a nonprofit, we go through the same process except that you don't apply for funding. And in our program, we walk you step by step by step through everything I just talked about today. Um, we do it two different ways. Uh, we're here with you live, so it's not all pre recorded. Uh, we're here with you live. We let you know what you need to do. Um, and then we take you through it step by step. And then we get back in with you live and we say, okay, what worked? What didn't work? Where did you get stuck? And then we help you move on to that very next piece. So here in Saskatchewan, for those of you who are here, um, you have 100% funding right now. And our next course is in May. Uh, I know you guys are getting very close to um, annual general meeting season. And so we're trying to sneak it in uh, just before it gets too busy for you. So yeah, 100% funding. Again, send me an email or uh, ask Lynn for my email and we can get you that information. We help you through that funding application if you do want funding. Uh, and if you decide that you don't want funding, that's fine too. The rest of Canada, uh, you are typically eligible for up to 80% funding. And yeah, we would, we've had a number of folks from out of the province, interesting. Um, versus, you know, right here in the province. So it's neat to see the variety of um, national organizations that are out there. So everyone is welcome. And it's all about getting your business to the first page of Google.
How can you tell that wasn't prepared at all? <laughs> well, it looks as though um, I'm sure people uh, will are like me and they always think of uh, questions the uh, the moment they leave a meeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, you've provided such uh, rich information in such a short period of time, Barb, as I knew you would. And um, I'm so excited that you were able to share this with, with everyone. Um, I know that people will be asking me, uh, it's always, people will get send emails immediately afterwards. Can I uh, get a copy of the slides that Barb showed? Can I get a copy of the recording? So, um, Barb, if you uh, could kindly share your slides with me, if you don't mind. Um, and uh, as soon as we're able to uh, get the recording up onto our YouTube channel, we will send out an email with that link for, uh, I, I know a lot of people had seemed to have problems today with uh, coming into the Zoom room. So I don't know what happened. Hmm. But, uh, a number of people said that they tried several times to get in. So uh, I know some people are going to want to watch that beginning part of the session. Okay. But anyways, um, it, are there any more kind of questions before we uh, uh, let Barb get on with the, the rest of the day? I did leave my email address uh, right in the chat there. So for anyone who is looking for it, it's there. And again, it's a standing offer. There's no carrot attached. If you would like to better understand your uh, Google rank, just shoot me a quick email and say, hey, I was there this morning and uh, we'd love to know. So absolutely, just let me know. Thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Carrie. Well, fantastic, everybody. And uh, please uh, take care during this next big last hurrah of winter. Yeah, fingers crossed that it's not all it's promising to be. Thank you, everyone. It was a pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, and yeah, it's it's really an, an honor to be able to serve uh, so many local organizations. So thank you. Hi, Carrie. It's nice to see you.